for our community segment, we have two incredibly interesting people to talk to. The first being a man called Giovanni Watson. He's visiting downtown Las Vegas, but he just came in from my motherland, Australia, on a gig. Um, but he's originally from LA. Very funny comedian that just wrapped up a movie, right? So why don't you tell me about that? Yes, I finished uh, my first lead in the motion picture uh, called Restored Me. Um, it's with, um, with some great, amazing actors, Malik Yoba, Gary Owen from Think Like a Man, Bill Duke, Stephen Bauer, and um, I'm just happy to, to bless the screen as my first lead in a motion picture. It's a which super big is, deal. It is due to drop this summer, so August. And what was the title again? Restored Me. It's How was it? Did you forget any lines? Yeah, or were you a superstar? You, know what? Star? No, you, an actor the, you know what? This yeah. is the first film I've been yeah. able to portray all of my person, my, my personations, my talents. <laughs> all my personalities. Well, yeah, from uh, <laughs> acting, dancing, making you laugh, making you yeah. cry. You know, even even displaying my impersonations. Like it's crazy. So you're a funny guy here, and you're going to be doing a skit of the Commonwealth later tonight. Yes. So tell me about that. You have a certain alter ego or something like that? It's my <laughs> uncle, my uncle Bobby Love. Okay. Bobby Love is a, a pimp, or also known as a man of leisure. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and 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 it's a character that I did and I created about three years ago, and. Um, I wrote a script for him and I put him on Vine and he blew up on Vine. Now people <laughs> like have fallen in love with this character so people ask me all the time to make appearances as him. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> He's more famous than me. <laughs> so, so how can people Stephen follow Colbert? Bobby on Vine? Well, you can follow Giovanni on Vine and just hope <laughs> that I'll do another Vine with Bobby Love. Okay. Uh, but my okay. Vine is Giovanni Watson. And um, you can see like my longer, more entertaining uh, videos on my Instagram at just Giovanni W. G I O V as in vagina. A N I W. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm ever going to forget how to spell your hey, name. Hey, a lot of people <laughs> misspell my name. I just want to make sure, you know, they do. Anytime know? I have to spell anything with V in it, I'm going to get the big O's. I'm going to say that. <laughs> you got the big O, the J? Actually, I just saw the vagina monologues at the Inspired oh, Theater on the weekend. It's an amazing thing so, how that yeah. thing talks. The monologues. The monologues. <laughs> I'm talking about the monologues. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna move on. Yes. What, what is whoa, what is your? <laughs> whoa! I'm sorry, I didn't see that coming. Finally, a funny episode. This is gonna be great. <laughs> so, what's your best tip for being popular on Vine, really quickly? My best what? What's your tip for being popular? Oh, on how do we all be as famous? Yeah. Uh, honestly, put up heaters, not deleters. And the thing is, the best way, like, I haven't been on Vine that long, but like. I did a few vines with a lot of big superstar viners that are great fans of mine, and I just spread it like herpes. It was just <laughs> <laughs> one minute I was at 200 followers, next thing I know I'm at over 200,000. Wow, yeah, okay. You All know, right. But it's just, I don't know, just do what you feel is funny in your, from your heart. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah, the audience members can check him out and come off tonight. What time are you doing a skit? Um, uh, uh, no, I don't care. 10? 10.30 to 12. 10.30, yeah. so the podcast 30. will finish in time and mm -hmm. make your way over there. Thank you yeah. so much for talking to us tonight. Yeah, thank, thank you. Well, I'm really excited. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Happy uh, oh. birthday. Thank you. So the next person I'm going to speak to is Ryan. Ryan is actually a new transplant to downtown Las Vegas, so please give it up for Ryan from Life House. Yeah, welcome to Welcome to Japan. So I want to ask you up front, what made you move to Vegas or downtown Las Vegas in the first place, being a tech, from a tech company? Well, I, I followed the progress of downtown, and I, I knew of the energy and the, the opportunity, and I wanted to be a part of that. And I wanted to be a part of a community where I could make a difference, make a footprint. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad that I moved down here because it's it's great. It's everything you hear about. The energy's here. The the, the relationships, the collisions, the communications, the like really so much. the here. warm beer. The, <laughs> It is a little warm tonight. <laughs> awesome. But yeah, I knew I wanted to be a part of something like this, and, and I, I'm glad I am. And you just sold your business, right? So congratulations yes, I did. Thank you on very that. Much. Yeah, so That's that awesome. that provides me the opportunity to kind of do what I always wanted to do is create and, and help people create and kind of work with young entrepreneurs and guide them uh, because I, I was self-made. So my company, I started with just two credit cards. Uh, I was never wow. invested in. I never oh took a goodness. loan. And th through that, I had to make a lot of mistakes because I didn't have the guidance or the mentoring and um, 
that's something that I want to provide to somebody else, and that's what I'm doing. I, I just started mentoring uh, some of the young entrepreneurs from the mill, uh, the work in oh, progress. Oh, yes, awesome. that's yeah. the new, the new uh, Yeah, where they, uh, they give entrepreneurs $5,000, mm -hmm. and they have four months to kind of produce an MVP, and uh, some get there and some don't, and the ones that do, I, I like to work with, and I even like to work with the ones that don't, because they, maybe I can guide them to something else. That's awesome, and you've been benefiting from the co-working opportunities here, too, to meet people and, and to kind of like find those people as well. Why don't you tell me about what that's been like, and where do you co-work from? Um, I work at the the Bridger Seventh uh, and Bridger, mm -hmm. the, the work in progress co-working space there, and uh, that that was probably the best thing I've I've ever done uh, down here. Is just get down there and be a part of it. Um, you that's run into people, scary, yeah. you know. Everybody talks about collisions, and, and that's mm -hmm. exactly what happens. Uh, you meet a lot of great people, and there's so much energy there, and and so much like-minded people. It kind of motivates you to to become better and, and create more, and that's. That's what I like to do. So tell us, That's why do you really spend your time fun. helping the people at the mill? Like, what feels good about? Uh, well, I like see a little bit of, uh, of myself in them, in them, and it, it, right. I don't want them to make the wrong decisions that I. I did. Are you going to avoid, yeah. right. <laughs> avoid the train? Right. Yeah. And and some of them, they need an investment. And, and, and I'm there, and I, I can help them out, and I get to where they need to be and, and guide them along the way. And it, it feels good to kind of take someone from just an idea and help them execute and get it to an MVP and, and maybe even exit. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. And like we look forward to hearing the mentoring stories that come out of your time here. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thanks again. If there's any members that want to get a hold of you, do you, yeah, uh, yeah. can they come down there and look for you? Oh, yeah. I'm in, the, I'm in the fourth or? floor of the, the Bridger building on 7th Street. Um, I'm at Ryan Negri on, uh, Insta on uh, Twitter and uh, you could just visit our website lycos.com right and maybe even download oh, the Oh yeah, I wanted, the, I wanted the mirror because yep. yeah, Lycos is social, social backwards. backwards. It would have right. been like a red rum thing. But there you go. It's <laughs> like pretty good, you know, not murder. That's right. Everybody's going to remember, remember it now. I so. love the name. It's very clever. Thank yeah, you so I much. I never thought of that. Very good. Awesome. Now, yeah. before we close out the show, um, I'm oh. going, oh sorry, this segment, I'm actually going to get Giovanni to to pick out a very special fortune cookie. This is the fortune for our whole community. Yes, this so is really? for the yeah. week. For the week, this is what we this have to live by. As a group. So no pressure. All right. <laughs> no pressure. All right. So what's going to happen is we're going to give this to the audience at the back. And the, the first person is going to open this fortune cookie. And have you ever played the, the game Telephone before? I don't know. Is it called okay. uh, Collect Call from Jail? I don't know. <laughs> That's what I'm used to. So, so what happens is um, somebody starts with an idea, they mm -hmm. whisper it to the person next to them, mm -hmm. that person whispers it to the person next to so them. So this is like when people spread rumors about somebody. This yes. is about rumors, yeah. By the time you hear it, it's completely different. Okay, yeah, gotcha. That's it. I like that. All, All right. right, so can yeah. we get our fortune cookie bearer to come and get the fortune? Mm. And we will follow Hello. up with that at the end yeah. of the show. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. All right, thank you guys for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>Super, super, super duper excited for this interview because I I was won over in our pre-interview. I think you're one of the coolest people ever. So our next guest, no which you are going to love, no is a hacker, super geek, extraordinaire, far, a former CTO and the founder and director of PetAbuse.com. She also created Downworthy, which is a plugin that you can put on your web browser that takes all those link bait titles that are like top 10 some Megan Fox in a bikinis or whatever, and then says what the article is actually about, which has helped countless people not get suckered <laughs> by them. And then to find out that her idols were very near and dear to my heart, Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and now Jane Goodall. But we're gonna talk about that in a minute. So please put your hair in a mohawk for our next guest, <laughs> Allison Giannato. Thank you very much. Okay, so you, you've combined a couple of interesting peer groups, people who love cats. And um, well, it's always a downer when I tell the story, so I'll try and rush through it. Uh, but I, I got involved with um, creating PetAbuse.com back in 2001 when uh, something happened in my neighborhood. Basically, somebody took a cat uh, from my neighbor and set it on fire with a Molotov cocktail, and we were all really upset, and we didn't know what to do. And I was uh, trying to figure out how to handle this, and of course, I sat there and said, gosh, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a website to be able to handle this kind of information? And I'm like, well, I'm actually a programmer, so it would make sense for me to do that. And uh, I hadn't actually intended on kind of running the organization 
I just sort of felt, figured I'd build the software and be like, here, you guys know what to do with this. Take that. Uh, but I actually couldn't give it away. But they didn't know <laughs> Nobody what to do wanted with it. it. <laughs> Nobody wanted it. <laughs> yeah, I think legal liability is, uh, is always a little scary. Yeah. And what, so, it, what so, it could do, how it could change the world, sure. will be soon, I assume. Well, uh, you know, it's a database that uh, tracks information on convicted animal abusers. And so not just name information, you know, the, the best analogy I can use for it is Megan's Law for, for animal abusers, uh, but it's not entirely accurate. We actually pull a lot more, pull an additional 20 data points, like for example, was the animal cruelty, uh, did it happen in the context of a domestic dispute or argument, uh, were there drugs or alcohol involved, was the animal, uh, you know, off leash or loose in the neighborhood. So basically trying to pull in and figure out some of these patterns. And since we also use uh, GIS location Basically, we can work with uh, communities and actually do a crime over overlay on their own kind of crime mapping, and we can overlay our data to see kind of some of those hot spots and, and uh, you know where additional humane education and additional resources uh, could be put to good use. Yeah, that's so cool. I mean, especially for putting your free time into an effort like that, which is taking up, I'm sure, all your free time, yeah. right? <laughs> and my money, and pretty your much money? everything, yeah. Yeah, pretty much everything. Uh, <laughs> well, that's great, but, I, but I'd love to see people have that kind of passion, and I think it's really going to make a difference. But let's talk about this Jane Goodall story, because um, I sometimes find myself acting a little bit more like Diane, but I don't want to. So explain what that means. So basically, I, w I had the opportunity to meet Jane Goodall um, a bunch of years ago. And for those of you who may or may not know, so Jane Goodall has done a lot of work in, uh, in the Gombe in, in Africa studying chimps. That was what she did in the 60s. She absolutely revolutionized. She and Diane Fossey, who's the other person, basically revolutionized the way that we looked at primates, understood empathy in animals. You know, she started to realize that they had individual personalities and nobody ever thought of animals that way before. They were using tools and like it completely changed everything. Right. Diane Fossey was also in Africa. She was in Rwanda at the time uh, and she was studying silverback uh, gorillas. And the thing is that their styles were super different. So Jane Goodall, for example, um, when people were trying to get onto the reserve and when poachers were on the reserve and they were trying to uh, kill the chimps, instead of getting angry at them, she gave them jobs because she realized that, uh, you know, poachers don't poach animals because they don't like animals. They're trying to feed their family. Uh, and Diane Fossey basically kidnapped the children of the poachers, actually tortured the poachers, uh, you know, really basically didn't have this kind of holistic uh, approach to anything. Uh, she was, of course, killed. Uh, uh, I don't remember when exactly she was killed, but there's still a, sh a shroud of mystery around who killed her. Was it poster poachers? Was it people on her own, uh, on her own staff? Because apparently there's evidence that she wasn't really super awesome with them either. Now, don't get me wrong, both of these women were amazing and they changed uh, everything for animals at that point, primates. Uh, and so one is not necessarily better than the other. But after I'd gotten a chance to talk to Jane Goodall and somebody asked her, you know, you, you were in Africa at the same time, uh, you know, you must have known Diane Fossey what do you think about her tactics? And that, that question, I had already started my organization at that point, that question really stuck with me. And I sat there and I thought, because this thing was born out of anger, because it was born out of frustration, this horrible thing had happened and I wanted to find some justice. And so this was how I handled it. And I remember sitting there and going, am I, am I actually Diane Fossey or am I Jane Goodall in this situation? Like that right. question right. and yeah. the fact that the people in this database are also human beings and they also have their own stories and like, Empathy is really, really important uh, across the boards. Even when you feel super justified in in being Diane Fossey, I mean, Diane Fossey felt super justified. You know, she was studying these amazing, amazing uh, animals, and people were trying to kill them. And so, of course, she felt really justified. But uh, you know, it comes down to uh, finding empathy in others, and also, <laughs> I mean, honestly, if Diane Fossey wasn't quite so difficult to work with there's a good chance that she could have been alive longer and she could have actually done more good. So even if you're not trying to be super altruistic, like it's better for you because you're probably going to be around longer if you, you know, if you can manage to find empathy in other people. Yeah. And so how do you apply it to smaller things? Like when it's not just about like an intense hate for somebody who's trying to kill a gorilla that you're working on, but like, how do you, how are you implementing it in your life on a day-to-day -day basis? It's hard, and I am not perfect at it. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, it's a process, definitely. Um, you know, just putting yourself in someone else's shoes, understanding. Uh, I think the easiest way that you can exercise empathy. I was not always super empathetic, um, and it took it took me a bit to kind of learn how. And the easiest way that you can do that is actually to participate in active listening and ask questions. You know, once you start to understand the relationships of people around you and what their situations are, it becomes a lot harder to just kind of be angry at them mm, right, across right, the board. Right. As soon as they have too much depth, then you can't just be, Yeah, exactly. You can't, can't just them write them off. And, yeah. Exactly. And so I think uh, really training yourself to ask questions and 
and try and find out more about people's stories is, is a great first step. And it's something that we, especially people in kind of startup culture where you're so trained to just talk about yourself all the time and oh my God, you know, this is my startup and this is my pitch and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I think, I think we get kind of caught up in our own little echo chamber there. And so I think it's really important to take a step back and be like. So are you actually like catching yourself in moments where you say to yourself like, okay, let me step back and absolutely. analyze this and absolutely. see how I'm looking at it. And then at that point you sometimes say, yep. Yep, you know, I'll, I'll, somebody's walking too slow in front of me on the on the, the sidewalk or whatever's yes. going on, and I start to get really ragey right. in that New York way, where it's like, really, you must be a tourist. Like, go, go, pull over, get out of the way. And then, you know, I'm like, okay, you know what? You know, maybe they're checking their phone because their mother's in the hospital. Uh, you know, like, there are infinity reasons why they may be acting like a tool, or like, I think that they're acting like a tool. I don't know their story. Uh, and so... Even if it's not true, sometimes they're just tools. It's better for you, it's better for everybody if you don't just kind of default to tool. What happened when your, a company you were previously working for got to around 45 people? You said the culture, even though you were keeping an eye on it, started to fall apart. Now how can you prevent that from happening if you're even looking at it when yeah. it happens? Well, I, I mean, so, so just to kind of give more of the backstory on this. When I started at my, the company I just left, uh, I think we were about 12 people. And when I left, we were pushing 100. Uh, and so, you know, over the course of six years, you see a lot and you, and you, you know, part of what drew me to that place and made it so amazing with this was this great family atmosphere and like, oh, uh, you know, it's 12 people. It, it really is kind of a family. Um, but part of the problem is as we grew, um, and, and this does happen, you, you actually don't realize it. Maintaining culture, maintaining a great culture, a family culture, a fun culture was actually a priority for us. And so no one was more, more surprised than us and me and the, the CEO as we kind of turned around and we looked at each other like, how did we get here? You know, we had a bunch of toxic people who were just being, they were doing things that toxic people do. Uh, and we couldn't figure out how we got there because culture had been so important. And I think in retrospect, uh, how, how can you stop it? I think the, the best way that you can stop it is, uh, is to make sure that your company puts empathy and trust as, as really, really important, important markers in your corporate culture. Not just empathy. Empathy is really important, and if you don't have that, uh, you know, you may as well just pack it in now because right. it's, it's going to implode. But yeah. trust also, so you're not micromanaging, you're not like, make trust that you're hiring good people. Uh, you know, learn about them, empathize with them, put yourself in their shoes and teach your managers to do a really good job with that. Uh, with, the, with new people, especially with the you know, kind of millennial uh, Gen Y employees that come in, uh, they tend to need a little more care and feeding. Uh, but you know, definitely make that a core value uh, of, of your company. It's, it's not just empathy, but also trust. Okay. And how, are you, and like, how do you measure and assess trust like, to even find out if people are doing a good or a bad job? What are some of the markers you can look for in a business environment? Well, I mean, I feel or like, I feel like your level of communication is, is a great indicator of that. When, when you don't have trust, and I've actually been through this, that's why I can say it with some level of, of certainty, when you don't have trust, people don't communicate because they're afraid that you're gonna find out something that they didn't do or something that they did do. Oh, and so there okay, becomes yeah. this kind of weird cloak and dagger thing and then suddenly people are trying to cover their asses and like it, it's, it right. turns and into this, and exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and so what you end up with is, is, a, is kind of a culture of fear. Uh, you know, fear of losing your job, fear of getting in trouble, fear of all of these things when you don't have that trust kind of built in and people don't feel really comfortable going to you or to their manager or to somebody else and saying, you know, I'm really having a problem with this. Uh, and likewise, if a manager, if you don't, if there isn't that mutual trust, uh, then a manager is going to have a harder time coming to an employee who, isn't, who maybe isn't doing a great job and maybe just needs either some more mentoring or honestly just needs to be fired. Sometimes that's oh, a thing. Uh, yeah, true, <laughs> Sometimes true. that's a thing. Yeah. Sometimes it's not a good fit. Um, but that, that trust is really, really important. I, and so I think, I think the level of communication that you see um, will really indicate that. People who trust each other communicate with each other. Look at it in a marriage, look at it in your friendships. Uh, the people that you trust are the people that you communicate openly with, uh, that you communicate frequently with. And what I saw was uh, the people that I think had the most trust, trust issues were the people that uh, didn't communicate. They kind of made it a point not to communicate and you really sort of had to drag all this information out of them. Whereas the people where you had better trust relationships with, they were always kind of keeping you in the loop proactively because right, right, right. they're not actually hiding anything. Um, That's 
So yeah. That is awesome. Okay, so thank you. I think there's many great pieces of advice there I think people can use. And, and awesome work putting all that time into a passion of yours. You. And I think it's going to make a big difference. So if you guys enjoy Vulgarity, um, you can definitely check her out <laughs> on Twitter. So Snipeyhead, S-N-I-P-E-Y-H-E-A-D. And then uh, there's also pet-abuse.com if you want to learn more about that. So thank That's you right. for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank you. thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Good. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, cheers. Wow. What's up, everybody? My name is Mac Holiday. I felt like I was going to sing for a second. What's up? Uh, how's everybody doing? I have a show on YouTube. It's called Holiday What TV. I celebrate holidays every day. So please subscribe. Thank you very much. For example, May is National Posture Month. Yes. Take a look at your neighbors. See who has a good posture. Ready? Chest out. Shoulders down. Chin straight ahead. All right. No, your posture is not working for me. Come on. Sit up straight. That's good. Okay, that's better. Um, tomorrow, tomorrow is no pants day. Yes. 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 This is celebrated the first Friday of May every year, and first Friday in downtown Vegas is tomorrow too. I'm going, not wearing any pants. Who else is going tomorrow wearing no pants? Yeah. So today, May 1st, is also National School Principals Day. Can anyone name any of your school principals from your past? If you can, shout it out. Chalmers. That's not bad. Anybody else? Are you, are you, like, are you having a hard time remembering them? Because all I can remember is like elementary school. What does that say? Is that weird? Can you, can you name a school principal you've had? I, you know, I don't think I can. You can't, can you? No. Crazy. Definitely not. <laughs> so May is National Business Image Improvement Month. This is a holiday, I feel, that is all about these two here. Are you guys seeing a lot of ego? A lot of ego happening here. We got entertainment and growth opportunities. These two ladies partners for two years. They've sponsored the podcast two times before. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And, and if they weren't busy enough, he's like the Ryan Seacrest here of downtown <laughs> Vegas. Uh, they're co-curating Creative Week right now. How sweet is that? So I want to hear a little bit about how Creative fell into the laps and how has it been going? Creative Week has been amazing. You know, we brought together 40 amazing entrepreneurs and amazing entertainers, brought them together to combine them with all the creative energy and the crazy creative leaders that we already have here in our community. It's been an amazing Creative Catalyst Week. Nice, now your business, one would think that entrepreneurs and athletes and entertainers don't need the same people to help them grow, but you say no. Yeah, you know, I am amazed. You know, I really think that the same characteristics, that undying optimism, that belief in yourself, that determination that it really takes to be successful and believe that you can actually be a successful entertainer is a lot of the same type of gumption that's required for successful entrepreneurs. So I find there's a lot in common and, you know, we really love working with both and helping people to do what they're putting on this planet to do. Amazing. Now, you both have different skill sets and you bring different things to the team. Nina, for example, you are a public speaking coach, helping right. your clients to hone in on their storytelling abilities. And guess what? Today is, by the way, May 1st is Executive Coaching Day. Oh my God, a holiday that's all about <laughs> Nina. So uh, tell me a little bit about how you became and why you're, you're, you're a coach and, and your varied client list I hear about. Yes, so I fell in love with public speaking when the power of somebody else's story pulled me out of, out of a really dark place in my life. And I personally believe that everybody has a unique gift. And that gift is your personal journey in life. And I feel that I was put on this earth to help people cultivate that and find that, to help people inspire the world. And it originally started my love for communications. Um, I have a marketing background, but I was terrified of public speaking. And people don't realize the fear of public speaking holds you back in life. So I am beyond passionate to help shire, you know, like, like me, I'm introverted, shire introverted people help share their unique journeys. And my client list has been amazing from public speakers to startup entrepreneurs to inventors. Inventors? 
<laughs> oh my god, it's National Inventors Month. Did you know that? <laughs> it really is. It's true. Wow. Yeah. I had any inventors here in the house tonight? Any inventors? Yeah, right here. Yeah, what do you do back there? What are you inventing? I invent software. You do? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I, heard, I saw your hand go up. Hardware. Hardware. Oh. And then Dan, Dan, wait in the back, I hear you're inventing some pickle juice things. Pickle juice. <laughs> yes. 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 Pickle juice stuff. Very exciting. All right. Moving back on to this. Um, so, Krista, you specialize in the consulting aspect of things. Why don't you expound? Sure. You know, I have always been that small town girl who walked fast, talked fast, thought fast, won a ton of fast growth awards, and led a really crazy life as an entrepreneur. So, I really wanted to help other entrepreneurs so they never felt alone in their crazy wild roller coaster that you have to go through to be successful as an entrepreneur. Your voice is very sexy and raspy tonight. <laughs> yes, yes, I sound like I should be singing in a jazz bar. It's been a really fun, creative week for That's us. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much <laughs> yes. for being here. Thank Happy you. holidays. Thanks this was fun. Us. Have a good night. Thank you. <laughs> we just had a moment over hardware, which is awesome. Um, I am here with Captain Kirk. What's your real name, Captain Kirk? Kirk Holmes. Okay, I'm sorry. His name is actually Kirk Holmes. I follow you on Twitter. I recognize yes. your face and everything, okay? I'm going to talk to you later. Okay. But for now, um, you are actually the last downtown podcast message receiver of the, of the fortune of the week, right? Yes. Okay, so without further ado, what did you hear as the fortune of the week? Regardless of your costume, you'll still be seen. That is actually really similar. No, I think this is, again, the closest that we've ever got. Um, the actual fortune of the week is you will find yourself poorly dressed for an occasion, but no one who matters will care. I think that's pretty good advice in life, right? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So if someone doesn't like your Google Glass, they're probably not someone you want to talk to because they don't like hardware, right? Yes. Or they think I'm a glass hole. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point, too. <laughs> Wonderful. And on that note, we'll see you next week, guys. Thanks for watching the podcast. Like a flashback, Vegas Tech, don't forget to spell it with the hashtag.